Gentlemen, this is a robbery. I'm Jason Horton. I'm Rebecca Lieb. And this is Ghost Town. Our St. Patrick's Day episode is a subject I've been wanting to cover for a very long time. It's not about beer or shamrocks, but it is iconically Bostonian, which feels very part of the St. Patrick's Day ethos, a criminal tale that happened in the early morning after St. Patrick's Day. Today, we're talking about the biggest art heist in history, the robbery of the Isabella Gardner Art Museum in 1990. But first, we have to go back to the mid-1800s, because of course we do. Isabella Stewart Gardner was born on April 14, 1840, to wealthy New York linen merchants. Gardner married the brother of a former girls' school classmate named John Gardner, who was at the time one of Boston's most eligible bachelors. While it was a situation everyone was pleased with, the new Gardner couple's life didn't go as planned. In 1863, their only son died at two years old, and after a miscarriage, Gardner was told she couldn't have any more children. Her best friend and sister-in-law died around the same time, and dealing with it all, Gardner became extremely depressed. In 1867, on the advice of her doctors, Gardner and her husband decided to take a lavish trip to Europe, that her life might depend on it. To give you context, at this point, Isabella was so depressed that she had to be taken aboard the ship on a stretcher. The two spent almost a year traveling, which truly revived Gardner. Her European vacation began her lifelong habit of obsessive scrapbooking, art appreciation. As a note, she was friends with all of the hot artists of the day, John Singer Sargent, James McNeil Whistler, Henry James, and more. And the fashionable high-profile socialite returned to East Coast society renewed. Gardner lived a good life traveling, amassing things from her journeys and ultimately creating a whole museum from all of the beautiful artifacts she purchased during her travels. Gardner died in 1924, not super notably, except for one very famous and very controversial appearance in 1912 at the very formal Boston Symphony Orchestra. Like a true Boston Red Sox fan, Gardner went to the event wearing a white headband with, quote, OU Red Sox stitched on it. People went insane. It was highly improper, very controversial. At the time, it was said to have, quote, almost caused a panic, which is perfect. After Gardner's death, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum, created wholly from Gardner's Venetian-inspired home and private collection, fell into financial disrepair. By 1990, the museum's security flaws were common knowledge among Boston's criminal elite, making it ripe for a heist. One thing to note is that Isabel lived on the fourth floor of the museum while she was alive, and every director after did the same, until the director who took the job right before the robbery. Anne Hawley was director from 1989 to 2015 and decided not to live in the museum. Her presence there might have stopped what would happen next or not. You be the judge. In the early morning hours of March 18, 1990, two individuals rang the museum's front door buzzer, which connected them to security through the intercom. They explained that they were police investigating a disturbance and needed to be buzzed in. The young guard on duty, 23-year-old Rick Abath, saw two men dressed in police uniforms, more or less, and one in what seemed like a fake mustache. He was apprehensive, but the quote-unquote cops said they were responding to a disturbance call linked to the St. Patrick's Day partying taking place outside. It seemed reasonable enough, so Abath let them in. They approached the security guard at his desk and asked if anyone else was in the museum and to bring them down. Abath radioed the 25-year-old Randy Hestand, the only other person at the museum, to come to the security desk. Once they were together and no one else was in the museum, Abath and Hestand were quickly overpowered and handcuffed, their mouths duct-taped. Gentlemen, this is a robbery, the burglars announced. They examined Abath and Hestan's wallets and explained that they knew where they lived, so to not tell authorities anything and that they would get a reward in about a year. Then the burglars disabled the security cameras and got to work removing priceless pieces of art from their frames. They set their sights on the museum's greatest treasures, including Christ in the Storm on the Sea of Galilee, the only known seascape painted by Rembrandt, a lady and gentleman in black, also by Rembrandt, and Johannes Vermeer's The Concert, one of just dozens of the Dutch Old Master's paintings to survive today. They also took a self-portrait sketch by Rembrandt, five sketches by French Impressionist Edward Degas, a small portrait of a man by Edward Manet, and an ancient Chinese bronze vase. 
The burglars attempted to remove the flag of Napoleon's imperial guard from its frame, but failed to do so, instead settling for a bronze, eagle-shaped ornament. Bizarrely, the burglars left possibly what was the most expensive work in the museum untouched, Titian's The Rape of Europa, which was hanging in the third-floor gallery. They also took the security recordings and after checked on the guards one last time to ask if they were comfortable. The two unnamed burglars left at 2.45 a.m. after making two separate trips with 13 works of art to their car, valued today at over $600 million. It was the biggest art heist in modern history and lasted just over an hour and a half. Let's take a break. Back in my day, the internet was a little bit nicer. Every week, we did this thing on Twitter called Follow Friday, where everyone tweeted about the coolest people that they followed. It was an amazing way to discover new people to follow because they were curated by the people that you already liked. When I started a podcast about internet culture, I knew that to do my part in making the internet a better place, that is what I wanted to do. My name is Eric Johnson, and I'm the host of the Follow Friday podcast. Every week, I talk to creative people about who they follow and why. When you listen to the show, you'll get top follow recommendations from YouTube creators like Tom Scott, podcasters like Ali Ward from Ologies, and comedians like Alexandra Petri from The Washington Post. Once again, the name of the podcast is Follow Friday. Search for it in your favorite podcast app or go to followfridaypodcast.com for transcripts, pictures, and the full audio of every episode. Good morning, Sodomites. It's me, your host, Zach Nui Towers, comedian and unofficial sex expert you may have seen on Netflix, Comedy Central, or Grindr. Because let's be honest, I am on that app saturating the cloud with semi-tasteful nudes. Good Morning, Sodomites is a weekly hour-long podcast where I do a deep dive on my guest's sexual journey. That's right. You're going to hear things like How Dan Savage Lost His Virginity, Bob the Drag Queen's Craziest Craigslist Hookup, The Weirdest Thing Margaret Cho Ever Found in Her Butt, and so much more. So pause whatever brilliant show you're listening to right now and go subscribe for free to Good Morning Sodomites wherever you get your podcasts. One more time, that's Good Morning Sodomites with Zach Noe Towers. Hi, I'm Olivia D'Andrea, host of the Globe Diaries podcast. This is not a self-help podcast. This is me being a friend to someone out there who needs it. I have struggled with disordered eating, anxiety, negative thinking, body image, loneliness. That really doesn't sound good when I list it all out. But yeah, I've had a lot of problems. Who hasn't? Everybody has problems. It's just that we don't really like to talk about it out loud because it's hard to openly share our struggles because it makes us vulnerable. But my belief is that talking about the things that have hurt us, our insecurities, is how we grow. So this podcast is about being real. Real life is not perfect like what we see on Instagram. Real life actually has struggle, and it really sucks sometimes. But remembering that our struggles is actually what makes life so great, because happiness grows from problems. So if you want to hang out with me and learn a thing or two, because I did go through this drastic five-year mental and physical self-transformation that you can find on YouTube, um, subscribe to the Globe Diaries podcast. You can find it on any podcast platform, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, etc., and let this just be a chill spot for us to grow together. Hi, hello, how are you? Hello, how are you? How are you doing? You look healthy. This is the check-in. Hello. This is, this is the time. You've, been, you've all been waiting for. The time is now. <laughs> That's right. We're going to center your whole universe sure. right at this moment. Every chakra will align to where you are right now in the present moment. Deep breaths. We want to thank anyone who's listening. Thank you for anyone supporting the show. Thank you to all our patrons. And thank you to our government. That's right. All hail the government. You know them. You love them. You obey them. The mayors. We got a little James Harrington. Hello. We got a little David Bull. Hello. We got a little Ashley Matson. Hello. We got a little Dara Rosenzweig. <laughs> Hello. And hot off the presses, we have some political news. We have a new mayor. I'm so excited. She has already given us some very hot tips, and I cannot wait to hear more from her. Kat Josell, welcome to law enforcement. You're going to do great. And our governor. That's right. The one true leader. Mm-hmm. 
the one who presides over them all. Our governor, Avian, Avian Noble. Noble. Wow. Does it feel better when we say it together or worse? If you want bonus episodes, early access, no ads, no chit chat. You don't need that bullshit in your life. Go to patreon.com slash ghost town pod. Now let's get back into it. We're heading back in. We're back inside the Isabel Gardner Museum, and we have Abath and Hestan, the two security guards, trapped in the basement until the police, called in by the next shift of guards, found them around 8.15 a.m. Of course, press loved it, like we always say, but the museum was in a panic. They offered a $10 million reward for the item's safe return, but none of the stolen works have ever been recovered. Let me repeat that. None of them have been recovered. Authorities were initially suspicious of the two guards on duty that night. Abath, a self-described hippie and rock guitarist, was a regular on the museum's night shift and knew the place inside and out. But he has long denied any role in the heist and was cleared from a possible suspect list. Quote, I was just this hippie guy who wasn't hurting anything, wasn't on anyone's radar, and the next day I was on everybody's radar for the largest art heist in history, he told NPR. But he wasn't alone. The suspect list was very long. Other suspects included many mob bosses, even famed Boston mob boss Whitey Bulger. It also included Brian DeWitt, a con man from Boston who dressed up as a FedEx worker in an attempted robbery of the Hyde Collection in Glens Falls, New York, back in 1981. Four years after the robbery, museum director Ann Hawley received an anonymous letter from someone who claimed to be attempting to negotiate a return of the artwork. The writer explained that they were a third-party negotiator and didn't know the identity of the burglars, just that the artwork was stolen to reduce a prison sentence. But as the opportunity had passed, there was no longer a motive to keep the artwork, which was being held in a, quote, non-common law country under climate-controlled conditions. And they wanted to negotiate a return. They also asked for immunity for themselves and all others involved, and of course, a $2.6 million sent to an offshore bank account at the same time the art was handed over. The letter's final request? If the museum was interested in negotiating, they should print a coded message in the Boston Globe. Museum director Ann Howley felt a lot of things upon receiving this letter, but of course she wanted to get to the bottom of it. She contacted the FBI, and a coded message was printed in the May 1st, 1994 edition of the Boston Globe. A few days later, a second letter arrived. In this letter, the writer acknowledged the museum would cooperate, but the writer had become fearful of what they perceived was a massive investigation by federal and state authorities to determine their identity. The letter explained that the writer needed time to reevaluate their options, but Hawley never heard from them again. And then the trail went cold until 2013. In 2013, the FBI announced that it had identified the two burglars with a, quote, high degree of confidence. Two years later, the FBI revealed the names of its primary suspects, George Reisfelder and Leonard DiMuzio, two men associated with the late Boston mob boss Carmelo Merlino. Both resembled police sketches of the criminals, and they also both died within one year of the heist. The investigators also suspected the art was transported via organized crime networks to Connecticut and Philadelphia, where the thieves attempted to sell the works in the black market. After those attempted sales, however, the artwork's trail goes cold. Security guard Rick Abath enters the picture again in 2015 when the United States Attorney's Office in Massachusetts revealed a rare security camera video. The grainy footage shows Abath, who was on guard during the day of March 17th as well, opening the same side doors used by the thieves and admitting an unidentified man in a waist-length coat and an upturned collar. Could be something, it could be nothing at all. Overall, the museum's security director, Anthony M. Armore, told The Times that the video, quote, raises more questions than it answers. Of course, dozens of theories about what happened have popped up over the years. Most people, including the FBI, argue that the works traveled through organized crime networks in Boston, probably through Merlino's associates. The FBI also believes a gangster named Louis Royce cased the museum as early as 1981, devising plans to light up smoke bombs and rush the galleries amidst the chaos. In 1982, when undercover FBI agents were investigating Royce and his associates for an unrelated art theft, they learned of their interest in robbing the Gardner Museum and warned the museum of the gang's plan. Royce was in prison for the actual Gardner Museum heist, but he shared his plan with pretty much everyone who would listen. Another former mobster, Robert Gentile, so many mobsters, has long maintained his innocence despite a bevy of evidence pointing to his involvement in the crime. The octogenarian was released from prison in 2019 after serving 54 months on an unrelated charge. 
He remains the only living person who likely has some kind of knowledge of who actually committed the 1990 heist. Another theory is that members of the IRA, the Irish Republic Army, were somehow involved in the crime. That is a theory that's kind of being bandied about, not a lot of supporting evidence, but speaks to the controversy and the widespread kind of paranoia about what happened. Even more recently, think this year, a new name has been added to the varied list of suspects. Jimmy Marks, who was shot twice on February 20th, 1991, outside his apartment about 25 minutes northeast of Boston. Marx's murder is currently unsolved, with no arrest in connection with it. It's a cold case, kind of come up in the conversation about the heist, but along with being pretty close to the museum, it goes a little bit deeper. Marx was a convicted bank robber and an associate of Robert Guarente, another low-importance person of interest in the case who died in 2004. Guarente had been with Marx earlier in the day of his death and is suspected of having actually been the one to pull the trigger on him. Quote, Marx had connections to subjects suspected of being involved in the Gardner Museum heist, Deputy Police Chief Mark O'Toole told the Boston Globe. Quote, we don't know what, if any, role he had, but very likely it was related to his death. Investigators believe that Gorente was at one point in possession of two of the stolen works, which he then handed over to Robert Gentile, who we talked about earlier as being a pretty primary suspect when the case began. Up until he died in 2021, Gentile denied any involvement in the case whatsoever. The whole Jimmy Marks connection with the Gardner Museum heist comes up because there was a recent anonymous tip to investigators that said before he died, way back in 1991, Jimmy Marks was, quote, bragging that he was not only in possession of some of the stolen Gardner artwork, he bragged that he had hidden it. Police searched his apartment, well, where he used to live, but obviously that was a long time ago, or he was bluffing, and they just didn't find anything. There are so many suspects in this case, and it just keeps getting older. The one thing that might save this case from going unsolved indefinitely is the fact that that artwork is probably still out there. I assume it hasn't been destroyed. Of course, we don't know that for sure. But the fact that these multi-million dollar, really priceless pieces of artworks are somewhere in circulation, maybe in someone's basement, who knows, gives me hope. Says Robert M. Poole of Smithsonian Magazine, quote, What continues to perplex those investigating the Gardner mystery is that no single motive or pattern seems to emerge from the thousands of pages of evidence gathered over the past 15 years. Were the works taken for love, money, ransom, glory, barter, or for some tangled combination of them all? Today, you can go visit the Gardner Museum in person or take a virtual tour. Both tours uniquely showcase what the thieves left behind. Empty frames that hang eerily on walls. Again, a reminder of a different phase of the museum's identity. And if you have any tips, even now, you should contact Security Chief Amore at reward at gardnermuseum.org. The museum is still offering a $10 million reward to anyone who provides information leading directly to the return of the stolen works. Hell, even someone involved in the theft itself can come forward. The statute of limitations on the crime has expired. That's right, 80-year-old Boston mobsters, I'm looking at you. And now, a Best Fiends affirmation. Your husband brags that he recorded 200,000 steps in the last month, but you're at level 3,832 on Best Fiends. Who deserves the bragging rights now? With over 7,000 brain-boosting, challenging levels, bragging never felt so easy. So download Best Fiends free from the App Store or Google Play today. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Play Best Fiends. Download free. And we're back with breaking news. Coke Zero Sugar might be the best Coke ever. That's right, Jim. Make sure to... Jim... Ooh, yes, this tastes like the best Coke ever to me. We're on the air. I need to try it first. With zero sugar and refreshingly delicious, is Coca-Cola Zero Sugar the best Coke ever? Pick up a half-liter six-pack from your local giant today. And now, a Best Fiends affirmation. Your husband brags that he recorded 200,000 steps in the last month. But you're at level 3,832 on Best Fiends. Who deserves the bragging rights now? With over 7,000 brain-boosting, challenging levels, bragging never felt so easy. 
So download Best Fiends free from the App Store or Google Play today. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Play, play.